you know, there's research coming out that that's what's important. The stronger your lower half, the better your pelvis is going to be able to rotate underneath your torso. If they're rotating together, you're running into issues. But if you're able to segment and go pelvis, then torso, you're going to put yourself into a really good position to not only throw more strikes, but you're going to throw more strikes with more velocity. Hey, this is More Than Velocity with Jordan Oseguera and Ryan Croton. I am Bart Pear, and today we are talking about a complete arm care training program and why that includes lower body training, why you need to be developing strength in the lower half just as much as the upper half. So I know Ryan's itching to get started. There is a blog post on here that that it's an older one, um, uh, but it kind of gives some of the key details in it, but Ryan's going to jump in and kind of take it maybe possibly in his own direction. Ryan, uh, why do you need lower body training? Oh, man. Um, for Just as a background, for those of you who may not know my research, it was heavily focused on lower body mechanics, uh, in particular how stride length optimization is important for the kinetic chain, which is a transfer of forces from the ground through the the throwing arm. And I think the fundamental thing about lower body strength that is critical is the application of ground reaction force. And a lot of people out there, they may not have uh, an opportunity to utilize a mound that has force plates in it that measure basically how your lower body pushes off the ground and how it pushes back on you. But better athletes, better throwing athletes, they have better horizontal force. So our training, we have to be able to have propulsion forces that push us forward, and we have to be able to have, you know, high level braking forces that push back on us. And so our lower body training has to have important aspects like that are directional um, uh, specific, you know, um, I've been working with a bunch of students. So in my spare time, I advise graduate students at two universities, but one at Louisiana Tech. I've had two kids that have looked at ground reaction forces in jumping and how it affects um, ground reaction forces in pitching. And there is a relationship there that their improvement of vertical jump power, which is the intersection of uh, lean body mass is what we looked at and jump height, it can improve velocity. So there's some element of truth that, you you know, you need strong legs to be able to throw hard, you know, and and I think particularly to throw safer. If you think about not having enough lower body power, you're going to have to make it up somewhere. And generally that's at the throwing arm. All right. So you've given us the, the scientific research background, Jordan, Take us to the practical and why why it matters. So to put what Ryan said into my understanding, make sure I have have this on the right 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 wavelength here, is we want guys to be able to create as much force towards home plate as possible. Once they land, they need to be able to stop that force and translate it up the body, correct? Yeah, hundred percent. Okay, because I heard propulsion and all these other things that I started thinking about uh, squids and how they use <laughs> – like I started going back to you know zoology class. Like, I don't know what's going on here. Um, but yeah, so from a pitching standpoint, to make this stuff transfer over to the field is it all comes down to you know what everyone's talking about now. It's been around for a long time, the kinematic sequence. You need to be able to go from linear energy to rotational energy back to linear when it comes to pitching. It's a very complex movement. To where if you have someone who can't brace that force they're creating and rotate their pelvis and then stop the pelvis and then rotate the torso, like you said, the arm has to be the last thing that has to make up for all that. And that is dangerous. You know, we've talked in the past. uh, I don't remember exactly when we talked about it, but we were talking about hand positions at foot contact and things like that and how it all comes down to the timing of rotation. You know, there's research coming out that that's what's important. The stronger your lower half the better your pelvis is going to be able to rotate underneath your torso. If they're rotating together, you're running into issues. But if you're able to segment and go pelvis, then torso, you're going to put yourself into a really good position to not only 
throw more strikes, but you're going to throw more strikes with more velocity. That, that makes perfect sense to me. So what does this lower body training look like? Because um, you say you want a strong lower body, but strength can be a lot of different things. So w- w- just just run with it. What is it? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you from my, my strength perspective. So when I took over as the player performance coordinator for the Angels, um, I had the wrong mentality uh, in, in how I wanted the coaches to operate in, in our training systems. The training that we had was highly bilateral, meaning two leg uh, exercises, a lot of squatting, uh, a lot of deadlifting, um, which are great lifts, but our preoccupation of those lifts may not be as uh, sport specific. And so, you know, Jordan's talked about it on previous podcasts about lumbopelvic control and how important that is to be able to stabilize your pelvis and um, not only in functional tests which has been shown to impact uh, performance, but also on the mound. And you really get this lumbo-pelvic control uh, training when you're doing single leg work, unilateral work, and going even more specific into, you know, lower body training um, as far as the unilateral side. Lunging is really important. There's a lot of uh, strength coaches out there, excuse me, on the college level who are actually testing athletes doing a three rep maximum um, rear foot elevated uh, split squat or, you know, it's a single leg um, test. Now, obviously, these athletes are ready for that type of training and that type of testing. But, you know, here we we get a little closer to what happens on the mound. And even when looking deeper in these lunges, you know, you have options. You have reverse lunges, you have lateral lunges, you have forward lunges. They all are important to have a mix. So you can't just stick with one type of unilateral exercise because you need to display force in all of those different planes. So obviously the Arm Care app measures the strength and range of motion of the rotator cuff scapula and it's looking for deficiencies. Should we be down the road, should we be doing that with the core, with the lower body and looking for, would fatigue show up in those places uh, the same way that it could with the arm? Yeah, I think for sure. I think, you know, the arm is giving us some kind of manifestation of energy leaks, strength loss, potentially in other parts of the body. Because like like Jordan mentioned, you know, you have all of these segments that have to rotate well and they have to operate together. And if they don't, we, we may be seeing a lot more fatigue of the throwing arm. So I think that would be a great way to go um, into looking at, you know, hip flexion strength, hamstring strength, quad strength you know, core strength, um, you know, that, that I think we can, we can eventually put our minds together and figure out how that works. Um, because this is going to give us a little bit better of a, a regional perspective of, of what's going on. Hey, Ryan, to, to, to give a little more something to think about on this, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that pitching, obviously you work in linear as well as rotational, and to go more in depth, you're, you're going frontal, sagittal, and transverse on your planes of movement. I heard you talk about multiple planes of movement. And you see a lot of systems out there are you know, only doing you know, core in one plane. They get into this, oh, well, we, we do crunches, we do leg raises, we hang on the pull-up bar, we lift our knees up to our chest. You know, I don't know all the names of these exercises you do. You know, I just am naturally gifted the way that I am. I just am built like this. I don't have to put in a lot of work. Um, but when it comes down to it, how much of an importance is it as a that was pitcher? A joke, by the way, Ryan, it went right over his head. <laughs> Ryan still doesn't understand sarcasm. Um, I'm thinking. <laughs> but when it comes down to pitching, how much you know importance do we need to put in training the core in all three planes of movement, as well as the full body? Yeah, I mean. I remember when I when I first worked with the Orioles, we we didn't do a lot of rotation. Um, we we had our athletes just say, "Hey, they hit enough, they pitch enough." We didn't. We were worried a little bit about potentially increasing their risk of oblique uh, tears. And the strains. crazy thing is, aren't oblique strains like one of the most common injuries in baseball? But nobody yeah. wants to train it. Yeah, they're they're common, and so you know we're getting smarter in how we're training uh, rotation, and we need it. 
because if we if we want to advance velocity, there needs it needs to come with a, a rotational speed improvement, whatever that is. It's different for different people, um, but small marginal gains can lead to you know more rotational energy to the throwing arm. And we've learned that um, at least in that plane, lower volume is better. You know, um, endurance is key. We need to have endurance, and I think that's a huge proponent to protecting us from oblique strains. But when we're doing rotation, especially we're, we're looking at power and we're usually wanting to keep our rep ranges to like five, you know, you might do three sets of five of a particular exercise um, because we want to have explosive uh, power. That's important. But I think where a lot of people also go wrong, you know, in, in terms of not training um, along a spectrum of loads, you know, so they might train with a, a med ball that's way too heavy. And it's not promoting speed and it's slowing things down and it's not creating um, the coordination pattern that they would need when they rotate, you know. And so that's the rotational plane. And then the frontal plane working side to side, that's also important. You know, if an athlete can tolerate side planks, you know, um, that's a great uh, particular exercise that can build endurance in the obliques and in uh, in other parts of the core. Um uh, a lot of the time, too, athletes don't do any stretching for their the the front part of their core. You know, we call that the rectus abdominis or the six pack area. Um, so I don't have one, but I wish I did. Um, and and we do things like uh, barbell rollouts. So we do eccentric training of the front part of the core section. So we have to have all of these because. They're, they're these huge, huge rubber bands in the body, you know, and the biggest stretch that we need is obviously that that uh, hip shoulder separation. And when we have those strong bands that can lengthen, man, that creates a lot of energy for force. So to get, to get some clarity on that. So I just heard you say stretching the rectus abdominis, but then I hear a barbell rollout and I don't think of stretch. So can you go into a little more clarity on that? Because for me, that's a full on. Like that, that's a tough movement, a barbell rollout. It, it, there's obviously a stretch going on in that. Yeah. But you, can you, can you go a little more in depth on yeah. the eccentric aspect? Cause I don't want myself to be confused on this. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there are progressions. So before you go to a barbell rollout, you probably do something like a stability ball rollout, which isn't as intense, but essentially you are holding something and rolling it further away from you. So, so the muscles that are stabilizing, it basically, um, you're, you're counteracting extension. You're tr it's like an anti-extension movement, you know, in terms of leaning back, you're trying to keep tension as you're rolling it away. So that, that's, you know, um, the rollout part just is a lengthening stimulus. So to and, put it into terms, I understand we're keeping tension in our core Yep. While we lengthen at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and, and we need that. We need that. Like you see a lot of pitchers, um, you know, they get into this extension pattern when they're at foot contact, you know, they're lean back. You're seeing a lot of stretching at the front of their, their abdominals. And, and that kind of adds to, to energy that's created, um, in that particular plane. You know, there's also sometimes a little bit of a lean. So there's this there's this leaning back and leaning with tilt that's also creating stretch of the oblique side. So you have all of these different lengthening contractions going on. So I'm not I'm not laughing because it's just it's great to see you get this jazzed up. Yeah, uh, I love it. So it's it's you can tell when <laughs> you get on a on a tangent. I heard you talking a little well, bit about hip and shoulder separation. Yep. And this is something that you know I've been you know, a huge proponent of for a long time. You finally became a believer in hip and shoulder separation. But I want to make sure we preface it by, you know, just increasing it is not the only thing. You have to have strength plus length. And that's kind of one of our big mottos we're always going with is strength and length. It can't just be one or the other. You need both because we saw it, you know, and in, in using 3D motion analysis, when guys would increase their ability – to have hip and shoulder separation, it didn't mean they were going to throw harder. But if they increased sure. uh, separation with core strength, now we had a winning combination. 
Yes. So I call that the three S's. If people want to just have a really quick acronym to be efficient in that pat in a rotational pattern, they have to have strength. They have to have speed. So speed of rotation is huge. And then they need stretch. Those three things have to work together. And if you have a lot of stretch, you don't have a lot of speed, you don't have a lot of strength, you're, you're not going to be able to accelerate as much. You're not going to put as much into the baseball. So, And it all starts, in a sense, with how it is you're able to create that stretch. You know, Would you agree with what you're doing from the ground up? Because yeah. if you're not able to generate, you know, we were talking earlier on that horizontal force, and tell me if this is this is making sense. So I want to make sure that I'm understanding it from, you know, from your mind to my mind, because obviously we we think in similar but very different ways at the same on the same stretch of things. But if you're able to create that horizontal force, you create the the strength. You're able to get there faster, as well as you're able to generate the power through it. Now you're going to be able to transfer more force into the baseball potentially. Yeah. Okay. You need. You need to be able to decelerate. So you're decelerating your pelvis at, at certain points and you're decelerating your rotation. So you're keeping your shoulders back. And then all of a sudden that pelvis hits peak speed, that stretch is happening. And then the, the trunk, you know, follows. Yeah. So and, you know, it, it, to it give some context on that, this was stuff we did when we were working together in, you know, the professional realm was we would use that motion analysis. We'd find our guys who are our really good accelerators, but their deceleration sucked. So we'd yep. hammer out that deceleration phase once they were moving and we know they had a strength base to handle it. Strength base was key, again, as always. Then we'd hammer out that deceleration work and we'd have guys start throwing you know, three, four, five, sometimes six or seven miles an hour harder before the end of the season. Mm -hmm. Yep. So don't skip leg day. <laughs> no, <laughs> never. <laughs> awesome, Would you awesome. ever microdose leg day? Yeah, I mean, in in season. So you know, this this kind of goes like, along with how you're planning your your programming. You don't want to encourage too much fatigue in season, and you do not want to have strength loss. You do not want to have power loss. You want to maintain plyometrics. You want to be doing jumping activities. So. You know, what you need to be able to do is say, okay, if my training in the off season takes an hour and 10 minutes to complete, you know, um, in season, you might want to scale that to a half an hour and you want to pick certain exercises that you're focused on. And, uh, you know, from, in my opinion, you do not want to miss out on unilateral exercise at all. You don't want to miss out on frontal plane jumping. So side to side jumping activities you know we we call them hydens um there's lots of you know some people call them a lateral bar, broad jump but doing those types of powerful movements can really help but um, a good strength coach will know how to uh, put those programs together and i think too on our app we have a good process of of managing in-season loads you know the app kind of it just understands from the athlete, what part it, of the it has core and lower body work as part of it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And it, it's really good. I mean, for the athletes out there that aren't working with a strength coach, don't have access to a gym, you know, th this is a great option for them. Um, and a lot of what, what I see in the training is frontal plane based, you know, and again, you have to have multi uh, dimensional training. But a lot of times, because it's very difficult, is to work our hip uh, in abduction. So basically, you know, opening the leg away from the midline. Um, and, and that builds a ton of strength because that's, that's our push-off force. You know, that's our, our hip stabilization, our lumbopelvic control when we land. So we, we really tackle that really well with our hip and core bands. Um, they're a, rate, a great complement to our, uh, our shoulder uh, bands for the, for the scap and rotator cuff. All right. Um, Jordan, anything else? We're going to leave it there. I think we covered that pretty well, kind of from all ends of it. Yeah. I mean, Hey, if I, I'm so excited about this stuff, if our, our listeners, you know, want to email us, if they have more questions, we could generate more discussion, please do. Um, it's a very, uh, dear topic to my heart. Yeah, and the best Finally way you can do that... Finally got you bought in on hip and shoulder separation. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, and the best way to do that is if you've got any questions at all, just go to support, uh, email support at armcare.com, and then we'll direct it. If it needs to go to Ryan, it'll get to Ryan, Jordan, whoever else, depending on what your what your question is or need is, and, and we'll get it to the right place. Um, all right, so I'm going to wrap this up here. Uh, another great, informative podcast, and uh, everybody, take care. Thank you.